and welcome to the monthly podcast of the Vestibular Special Interest Group of the Neurology Section of the American Physical Therapy Association. Today's topic is vertigo in the emergency department. I will be your moderator today. My name is Wendy Creekles, and I'm a physical therapist on faculty at the University of Colorado, and I'm happy to introduce our speaker today, Lisa Tenbarge, who's also a physical therapist. And Lisa, if you could please give us a brief instruction, uh, sorry, a brief introduction of yourself and where you work. Uh, no problem. Um, hello, everyone, and thanks so much for having me, but uh, uh, as Wendy said, I'm a physical therapist. I work at Flagstaff Medical Center in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, I actually, it's my 24-year anniversary today. I started at FMC 24 years ago today. And uh, I have been practicing exclusively in the emergency department for nine and a half years. So I did uh, about 15 years of outpatient therapy prior to uh, starting in the emergency department. But, Excellent. So you're one of our pioneers in bringing physical therapy to the emergency department. That's exciting. <laughs> um, give us, a, you know, it's been it's yeah. been a really good journey. Yeah. Give us a brief um, overview for a lot of vestibular physical therapists. The emergency department may be new. So um, tell us, you know, what the current appropriate term is. A lot of people still use emergency room ER. Um, but we seem to have shifted to ED. Could you just clarify for us what the most appropriate term is? That um, really what's being used <clears throat> in most places that I know is, is emergency department, and I think I think it's just streamlining with the rest of the hospital systems. Every all of the uh, other departments are referred to by department, not not room. I think ER is just a is just a term that people are very familiar with, and um, but really the more current appropriate term is, is ED. Okay, great. So we'll refer to that as we move forward. So, Lisa, give us a brief overview of physical therapy services in the emergency department as a whole and what the role of the physical therapist is. Absolutely. We, um, <clears throat> we provide services um, eight hours a shift uh, between 11 and 7.30. So we start at 11 a.m. and go till 7.30 p.m., and that is largely because uh, the majority of the types of patients that are appropriate for us at, after looking at the uh, kind of who comes into the ER and when, um, that seems to be the time where there are the most people that, that are appropriate for us to see. So we provide kind of a wide variety of uh, assessment, treatment, education for uh, uh, diagnoses that range, I would say, primarily musculoskeletal. Um, we see a lot of whiplash injuries, a lot of low back pain, um, uh, a lot of orthopedic injuries that are non-fractured. So if it's if it's fractured, there's there's less that we do at the moment. Although we do do some splinting and uh, a lot of education, but um, uh, the vestibular portion of the patients that we see is, is is certainly fewer patients on the whole. It's probably more like a two to three percent mm -hmm. um, in general, but uh, uh, but they but they are definitely a percentage of the patients that we see. When uh, with musculoskeletal patients, we uh, we actually I think provide a more specific uh, diagnosis. So, in other words, as an example, um, prior to having physical therapy in the ER, if an ER physician, if somebody had a, a let's say a knee injury, um, that they did X-rays and there's no there's no fractures, and they uh, they may diagnose the patient with an uh, internal knee derangement and send them to orthopedics where. The, when we come in, we do a, you know a really specific musculoskeletal exam and say we can it, actually this is a grade two MCL spray with no meniscal involvement and here's how we're going to approach this from a stability and and uh, early education standpoint um, uh, and and so the outcomes I think are are much improved just by having us um, involved in that early intervention piece. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That sounds great. Um, so tell me how the flow of someone coming in with vertigo would go in your emergency department. How are they triaged and by which healthcare <laughs> professional are they triaged first? Okay. So when uh, somebody comes in uh, with vertigo, the first stop for them is the triage uh, area, and that's done by a registered nurse. Typically, and they're going to do an initial assessment. They're going to do vitals. They're going to look at their med list. They're going to check for neuroscience. They're 
Um, they're going to take their history. Is this something that they've had in the past? Is um, all of those things and determine an acuity. So they uh, uh, sort of rate the patient, if you will, based on the other patients that are waiting. And so they give them either a higher acuity rating, um, which will determine how quickly they're brought back uh, to okay. be evaluated by the physician. The goal is always to get them to the physician as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, and then how how do these patients funnel through? They would go to the nurse. She would determine, gosh, this really sounds like BPPV. Do they go to the physician then, or are there other tests right. and measures so, in the interim before they get to you? Right, and so typically there are some triage protocols that allow for the nurses to order some tests. Um, to my knowledge, they don't have any that are specific to vertigo. Okay. So the patient would then, they, but they typically get a higher acuity rating because many times their chief complaint is dizziness. Right. Um, but they, they may be throwing up. They may be, you know, they may be having uh, uh, their, their uh, rating acuity-wise typically brings them back a little quicker to the physician. And so the physician then takes a history and uh, makes the determination or uh, starts to do the rule out for any more um, uh, uh, more dangerous disorders, if that's a better way mm -hmm. to say that. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, in other words, a cardiovascular incident or um, some sort of, you know, metabolic problem or, a, uh, I don't know, a med medication issue or whatever right. it is that, that um, may be an, an immediate life-threatening issue. And if so, then sometimes they may order tests that are relevant to that. So, if they screen them and they think, oh, this is this has a central nervous system, they feel like it has a central nervous system component, then they're going to be more likely to then order a CT scanner and MRI of the brain or do start to do lab work to, to try to get um, an idea that way. Now, when they do their initial examination and the signs and symptoms are really pointing more towards a positional vertigo issue, then that's when they typically will... Um, uh, get physical therapy involved. So they'll then initiate a physical therapy consult. And because we're housed in the ER, we, are, we don't, we, we're not on an on-call system. We're actually there. We have a space in the emergency department. So we're immediately available. And um, then we go in. And typically what the physical therapist does in the uh, emergency department setting is we still perform our own examination. So we're still going through a cranial nerve screen and um, checking the range of motion of the neck to make sure they're going to be able to tolerate testing and maybe doing DBI testing or any other um, testing that seems, you know, or history taking that seems appropriate, uh, making sure there's no other neurologic um, indications. And then um, uh, most typically I would say the hall pike is, is probably the most common uh, test that I do in the ER to determine um, evidence of BPPD. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the Hulk Pike, there are a few of our physicians that are familiar with it, um, uh, that do perform it, um, but a lot of times, I'll, you know, when I talk to them, they may or may not have been looking at or looking for nystagmus, so, so the, the differentiation of specific types of BPPD are not made at that point. So, so when we'll, the physical therapist then will go in to Hulk Pike um, make a determination of uh, canal lithiasis versus tubular lithiasis and which canal uh, it, uh, it, the BPP is, is present in, um, and then and then uh, take them through the the canal through positioning if if it's indicated. Okay, great. And do you find that the hall pike seems to pick up the majority of your positional vertigo, or do you also do a roll test or something for the horizontal canal? Um, <clears throat> because I, you know, I think because the horizontal canal is less is less common, I I don't tend to do it as a standard. Um, right. But if if it was indicated, at, you know, when doing the whole pocket, if it was indicated, then then I would I would add that. I would say too that <coughs> excuse me, the um uh frequently the um will ask the physicians, um, and, and this was sort of a learning curve for me in the ER, but so commonly what they would do when they first came in is that they're, they're interested in making the patient more comfortable, and so they would immediately give them Anivert or Meclizine right. um, to help quell their symptoms. And so we've talked a lot about, and if you are considering that it's positional vertigo, could you wait? If you want to give a medication for... Um, 
for uh, uh, nausea, um, okay, but can you hold on on the Metzlinger antivirus so that we get a good, accurate test? Great. Um, and how did so you? No, yeah. How did you broach that with your physicians? Because it's a little bit of the physical therapist delving into their turf of medications. Would you say you did that after you had already had a good long? Um, kind of history and relationship built, or did you do um, that from the get-go? Well, kind of when we started treating vestibular patients, it's um, it was something that we just talked to them about. And what I found with the ER physicians, I found them incredibly open. Uh-huh. To, um, they they really know what they're good at, and by, by working with physical therapists over this extended time period, they've really gotten to know what we're good at. So they are very open to... Uh, communication when it comes to physical therapy diagnoses and, and, and things that we can do and treat in the ER. So they're very, it's a very collegial relationship, uh-huh. uh, at, at least in my setting, um, and they are very open to those conversations. So I, I didn't find any, any issues at all with, with asking that. Now, I have to sometimes remind them. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, that comes up frequently because it just, it just is one of those things I don't think about and they, you know, they're, or they, they order it or they say, or they forget to say wait until after physical therapy consult, and so the nurse gives it ahead of time. And um, But the nurses are actually becoming more and more accustomed to that, too, where now even if the physician orders it, if they've ordered physical therapy, too, they'll actually wait, even though it hasn't been um, specifically said by the physician. The nurses will wait because they know that we've said, you know, please hold on that if you can before um, prior to our evaluation. Because frequently the reality is if it is BPPB, um, and your listeners know this, but um, but it can be treated so successfully with with the kennel through positioning that frequently then the medicines aren't necessary. Right. So it's a so uh, <coughs> so, so I, I find that um, so so that uh, that was a really long answer to your really actually short okay. question, which is <laughs> they're actually very open to to uh, conversations. They've, I found them to be very open to that, especially when they understand uh, why they don't. They don't, they don't have a problem with holding on that at all. I think it's a great um, model for team cohesion and collegial relationships amongst nursing physicians. I don't know if you get residents coming through, but, I mean, I, I think physical therapy, I, I love the model that the physical therapists are really shoulder to shoulder with the other health care professionals, and you're all seen, you know, somewhat as equals with strengths in different areas, so... I think that's great. Sure. Yeah, that's it's a very it's a I would say almost across the the board there are in the ER setting the nurse is such a patient advocate that um, if if uh, the, the better relationship that physical therapy has with nursing in the emergency department I think the more successful they are because they are advocate frequently if I'm seeing a pa- they they're seeing a patient um, they may see indications for physical therapy especially since. Uh, we've been in there. The longer we're in there, the more they know about what we do, and they they think, oh, the last time I had this patient with this this sort of physical therapy is very successful with this. So they think, even if it hasn't come up with the physician, or even if it hasn't been a patient that's been tagged that's been identified by me, they they are frequently the ones that say, hey, do you think this would be indicated? And um, so we we rely on them a lot actually. But it is de- it is definitely a very collegial relationship. That's great. And now, um, initially you had brought up whiplash, and I'm just curious, um, because I can imagine the emergency department sees a fair number of whiplash, um, people with whiplash. Um, Is any vestibular piece a part and parcel to you evaluating someone with whiplash, or do you tend to focus more on the cervical injury initially and then maybe order follow-up? Or do you do, say, a hall pike on everyone who comes in with whiplash? Or, you know, what kind of triggers you to look for vestibular as well as cervical problems? I think that um, what I found in treating the people that come in, not with whiplash but with vertigo, there's always a question about have you had trauma, you know, okay. any trauma, any whiplash injuries, that kind of thing. It's a common, It's a common standard question when evaluating someone with vertigo in the ER. I would say conversely, when I'm evaluating someone with uh, a cervical injury, like a whiplash injury, whether or not I include um, the hull pipe would be completely symptomatic. If, if they complained of symptoms of dizziness or symptoms of movement, then absolutely, and I have done it. But I would say it's a, it's less common. So when they first come in, they're, 
their primary complaints are musculoskeletal. Right. Their, you know, neck pain and um, muscular pain and sometimes uh, sometimes nausea, but not typically not typically dizziness, at least not right away. Right. So I would say we talk. We sometimes have a conversation about. You know, the, these are all possibilities of this. This is if you start to see these symptoms, this would be the appropriate place to go for some follow-up evaluation. Right. Great. So it's kind of in the background of what things are available to you, but the primary Absolutely. presentation is pain and et cetera from the neck injury. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, but you know, having said that, I will say that I have had occasion where there are patients that um, <clears throat> the uh, it, it'll almost come in passing. We're going through, a, you know, a, a typical whiplash exam, and um, and as we go through normal range of motion testing, they say, um, "Oh, that that kind of makes me dizzy. That kind of makes me spin." Oh, okay. Uh, so then we, you know, so we tailor it uh, um, uh, to what they what their symptoms what their symptom presentation is. Right. Great. So um, let's say a person with vertigo comes into the emergency department. Um, they are triaged by the nurse, they go to the physician, and the physician doesn't rule out everything. The physician thinks, okay, this person's having an acute Meniere's attack, they have a history of Meniere's, or um, maybe they have vestibular migraine, or something along those lines that really do require some medical treatment. Do they ever refer to physical therapy to be another resource, maybe an outpatient follow-up, maybe education in how to limit movement while their symptoms are exacerbated? Or does that person mm-hmm. bypass physical therapy? Um, I would say uh, some of that depends on the, the physician. But I would say in general, um, they may not be uh, a physical therapy consult in the emergency department, um, but as Again, as time has gone on and, and we've been able to educate the physicians, we do have a couple of local physical therapy clinics that actually specialize in vestibular therapy. And so um, now they know that that's available, they're, they're much more likely to refer the patients in addition to referring them to either ENT or neurology or some other specialty to get um, further diagnostics or, or treatment done. Um, in addition to that, they'll also uh, consider referral to outpatient therapy for for treatment. Okay, um, so they don't typically see physical therapy in the emergency room setting, but they're, it seems like the trend is better that they are placing an outpatient referral. Much more so as now. As a trend, yeah. yeah. Much more so now, for sure, yeah. And, and typically in the ER, I, wouldn't, I, I would say it's more uncommon for someone to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, have Meniere's or labyrinthitis diagnosed in the ER um, uh, but uh, but to have, uh, 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 with the exception being someone who has a history of, right. of one or the other. Right. Yeah, if they have a history, then they assume it's, I think they probably assume it's, it's after ruling out any other, you know, more dangerous disorder, they're, they're identifying, okay, this is probably an exacerbation of the Meniere's or labyrinthitis, and then give them, give them follow-up instructions um, right. uh, for, each, for each diagnosis. Okay, so then I think there would be I think there would be potential, but but I think that because there's um, you know uh, besides education, there's not a lot that we're doing in the immediate right for treatment. I, th- I think we're not thought of as much, and that that just may be um, uh, an education from my end to them. Right. I'd say there there may be other things that we can provide. Absolutely. Um, so. You probably have, I'm guessing, a process for follow-up and the PT's role upon discharge from the emergency department, regardless of diagnosis or problem. So let's say it's a a knee problem or they've had BPV and you've treated it. Do you send them away with any kind of home program? Do you send an automatic referral? Is there a phone number they can call if they get a recurrence? You know, kind of what's mm-hmm. that? How how do they go back out into society? What do they take with them? Gotcha. So um, ours is sort of a sort of a probably a, um, some of it depends on how they respond to treatment. So if they have really good resolution of symptoms, which many of them do, 
then um, I give them a lot of information about here are follow-up clinics if, if these symptoms haven't uh, subsided or if they come back. Um, here are clinics locally that you don't have to make another emergency room visit. You can see them directly for um, this information. I do have a lot of pre-printed um, educational information about mm -hmm. BTPD, the causes, the home treatment. I think there was a study, I think in 2010, that talked about the um, efficacy of, of doing that epi maneuver even when someone is just instructed how to do it. Mm -hmm. So, we, I, you know, as we go through the epi maneuver in the ER, once a patient has sort of had a good response to that, um, they then know how to do it themselves, instruct them and how to do it themselves so they can they can attempt that first if that's if it's um, indicated and um, but we definitely give them follow up information on where where the local clinics are, including phone numbers and everything else. So they get so they get a handout of of uh, specific information about the PPD um, etiologies and treatments and follow up and um, I've modified it some over the years just because um, initially, we used to give them a pretty strict pre uh, post treatment protocol mm -hmm. with not moving you know sleeping in an upright position and all that all those kind of things but there you know there have been studies since that say well that that doesn 't seem to make a big difference as as far as their long term outcomes so so um, and in some cases might even if they are still having any symptoms, avoiding those positions would inhibit the the um, habituation that that happens when they do so <laughs> So we uh, we give them we get them instructions and um, where to follow up and then information as well. Okay, and then do, does it seem to be working? It's simply your uh, opinion anecdotally, but do you see frequent <coughs> flyers come in with BPPV every six months, or does it seem like, or maybe you have um, relationships with the clinics that you refer to if they have a recurrence, they go to them. Do you have any any sort of information about what actually does happen in follow-up? Mm -hmm. um, I have, you know, the one advantage of Flagstaff, it's a, it's a pretty small community and the physical therapists um, in this town are we're, um, pretty good about it. I communicate a lot with the, with the therapists in town, especially if I refer patients to their clinics. So, um, so I do talk to them and I, so I do hear about the patients that, that do follow-up um, and sometimes uh, uh, they contact me. It's okay. it, can go, it can go both ways as far as the follow-up goes. But they, um, <clears throat> I would say I see a, um, a very low reoccurrence of, of visits to the emergency department for this problem. Right. And so right. one, could, one could make the jump that yeah. <laughs> it's because they know where to go to get that treatment versus yeah. coming to the ER. So... Yeah. so um, I would say uh, it's still a pretty low percentage of the patients we see in general, but the ones that do that we do see, um, uh, I see a very low reoccurrence rate. Right. Yeah, that's great. It'd be great to study, you know, kind of follow mm -hmm. those people and what happens to them long term. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I see. I see a lot of indications for um, outcome studies. Right. And now, it's, especially you know, in that regard, I think that would be. Yeah, with healthcare reform and the use of emergency departments and the uninsured and everything that's kind of coming to light, I think um, <coughs> physical therapists in the emergency department are really well poised to show how you do make a difference. Perhaps, you know, Absolutely. I believe it. Yeah, but yeah. utilization for sure. Mm -hmm. So um, that kind of leads us to, you know, the future. So where do you see physical therapy services in the emergency department changing, say, in the next five years or even ten years? Or what changes do you think would be beneficial? What would you like to see improve? Well, what I'd really like to see is um, more direct access uh, to physical therapy services. Not, um, so not just in the idea of having physical therapy available in the emergency department because it's still relatively um from from what I know of people across the country it's still there's still very few emergency departments that have physical therapy available mm -hmm. so that would be the first step is I'd love to see physical therapy in every ER yes at, at the very least available in every ER yeah. that they have access a lot of hospitals tell me they have access just on an on call or a paging system 
Um, but the problem is when you're not in there, there's not the opportunity to educate um, the physicians and the nurses and everything else and build that collegial relationship. Otherwise, they don't, you know, they think about you in extreme cases, but they don't think about this, this huge, vast majority of patients that, are, that can benefit, um, which they do if you're there all, right. all the time. So Absolutely. What, so on a, on a large scale, I'd love to see physical therapy in every emergency department. Um, and within that, I would love to see more direct access. So in an ideal setting, I would love to see, you know, the triage setting identify this, a musculoskeletal injury and have physical therapy be able to see them right away. So, I, you know, that that, uh, that may be, um, you know, I don't know that um, physicians will ever be completely comfortable with um, physical therapists seeing them uh Initially, but you know, as as your listeners know, that we're we're very uh, good at differential diagnosis, and we know what we don't know. So, especially in the emergency setting, um, it's very important to to be able to engage that. And um, and my my thought would be if you know we see musculoskeletal um, disorders in, in the course of our exam. Uh, we see that, no, there's evidence that maybe it's not a musculoskeletal disorder and the referral goes uh, to the physician. Right. Yes, but but so, you see, so you see it's more of a, it would be a change in the way it's done now. The way it's done now, it always, they always see the physician first and and then are referred to us. So right. I'd love to see in the future, I would love to see us working more on a uh, on an even greater collegial level and being able to see them directly. Right. So I think it would, it would, it would cut costs, it would cut... Um, it would cut time mm-hmm. in the ER. They would um, still start. So th- those are the kind of things that I think I, I, I would like to see. I think, uh, I think and there's, um, as far as just getting more physical therapists into more ERs, we're seeing conversations happen all over the uh, country about, uh, I, I get calls all the time about people who are interested in starting a, a program of physical therapy in the ER. And so the APTA has actually done a great job of uh, creating a toolkit, uh, which is on their website, um, uh, that uh, it's called an emergency department toolkit, I, I think is the, the name of it. And, and it has a whole host of resources and list of information about um, some things that are uh, beneficial to those starting up, starting a program. So, so we, they have a blog that, that people... Um, have conversations throughout the country that this is what's happening in my ER and how do you guys handle this and um, so there's so conversations are definitely um, going up so hopefully we'll we'll meet that goal. That's great. That's a great resource. I'm glad you brought that up. Excellent. Um, well, those are all the questions I had for you today. Unless there's anything else you'd like to add, anything we forgot to cover. Um, I think I think we did a pretty good job. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. I so mean, much. I can talk about it all day, <laughs> <laughs> and I could listen to it all day. <laughs> I don't know about our listeners, but um, but I really, I truly feel this is a really exciting place for physical therapists to be poised, and the vestibular portion of the, you know, exam is one small um, piece, but. I think also a very important piece for our patients. It can really um, kind of transform how patients with BPPV have been treated in the I, past. I think absolutely, and I think that when it's appropriate and when it's um, correctly diagnosed and the treatment implemented, there is it's it's so successful, and patients are so have such a good outcome from it that um, I hope to see it um, employed in other settings for sure. Right. That's great. Okay. Well, thank you so much um, for joining us today, Lisa, and our listeners. Um, On behalf of the Vestibular Special Interest Group of the Neurology Section, I thank you for participating in our discussion today, and please stay tuned for our upcoming um, monthly podcast. Have a good day. Thanks. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.